Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Accessibility and Mobile Devices Updates from the Field. We're really excited about this presentation, particularly today, because uh, we have discovered some really cool, innovative, um, pre-existing tools that will really help you as you work with your, your students. So I'm Jennifer Kordoff. I'm an associate professor at Azusa Pacific University in Azusa, California. I work in the Masters of Education uh, Learning and Technology program. And I'm going to now send it right on over to my dear friend Chris Wanger to introduce himself and start us out. Chris. Hello, my name is Chris Winger. I am currently a speech language pathologist. I work in the high school setting with a variety of kids. And um, directly after this, I work with um, our young population at a private practice um, targeting two to five year olds. Um, my background is teaching in the classroom for mild moderate disabilities. And prior to that, I worked as a website designer. So I kind of cover a lot of grounds with technology and infuse them into the education world, more specifically the special education world. So it's a fun time. Yeah, but Chris, you, you also work with adults, don't you? Don't you work for also with the elderly with communication disorders? And that's within the hospital setting, correct. I do that as well. Yeah. Um, that's a part-time that's thing so I do, cool. and that's, that is fun, yeah. I mean, really talking about accessibility, um, that covers – all ages, you know, from 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 right. birth until the end. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> we really cover grounds on that. All right. So you're up with the updates on iOS 12, Chris. Okay. So there are a few updates that have occurred within the iOS uh, 12 update. Um, some of them have kind of overlap with iOS 11, um, and we're going to talk about two of those things. Um, the Siri shortcuts is very much updated in iOS 12, and then we'll talk about the screen capture capability. And um, since I'm not able to mirror my, my device on, onto this um, due to the sound um, confliction, I have a couple videos that will help um, give you guys more of a visual on how to access these. Um, but one major update in the iOS 12 uh, is the Siri shortcuts. And that is um, a very big um, update because it now is competitive with Google Home and Amazon Alexa. As you know, in the past, there's been some difficulties with being able to use Siri and it knowing exactly what commands you're looking for. It would generally pull up a website when you use Siri. And so now you can customize your shortcuts to cater to any app that's on your phone or your device and make it very more specific. Um, and so um, we'll discuss that a little bit um, in detail on how you can align that with your um, third-party applications. Um, so within that, what you would want to do to access it is you would want to go into your settings. And within your settings, you would just scroll down to where it says Siri and search. And within Siri and search, um, you can create a variety of customized capabilities and, and things that you would use for specific tasks. So for example, if you use the app TripIt um, for your traveling and your flights, um, you can ask Siri for details about your next trip, and then what Siri will do is it will use the TripIt app to read your upcoming itinerary. Um, so it will let you know the flight times, if there's any delays. Um, you can ask Siri to remind you um, where you're supposed to be. Um, it's also um, very helpful in regards to the location services on your phone. So if Siri or your phone notices that you're not in the right location at the right time, it will prompt you with a reminder that you need to be to the airport within an hour or two um, based on your itinerary. Um, the other really cool thing, as there's some other examples, are if you use an app such as Tile, um, there's updates for the iOS 12 that um, rather than opening up the Tile app on your iPhone to find your keys, you can just ask Siri, where are my keys? And they'll locate them for you without even having to go into your phone. The cool thing that um, it also 
um, in, is updated is that you don't have to have your phone plugged in like you used to have to in order to access Siri. You can just program it by, by saying your command and it'll open it up. I would say it right now, but I fear that he would interrupt what I'm doing here and open up Siri. Um, but those same shortcuts are available uh, throughout your phone for other actions, such as sending text messages or starting a playlist at the gym um, and just a variety of others. So that's a really cool up update for iOS 12 on the Siri shortcuts. Very helpful. Um, the second update that it came out with iOS 11, and I think it was such a huge update to the phone because we were looking for capabilities to screen capture. Um, well, now you can, and it's more fluid and more responsive with iOS 12. And so you would access that. I have a couple videos here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to show you two videos on how to access that so you can get a kind of a live demonstration on how those work. So let me share my screen here, and then we're going to open this up. And Jennifer, can you see it on your end? Yes, I can see it on my end. And Daniela, we're working on it. Uh, uh, Chris is going to be sure to, to show you some things right now. Do value your feedback. So please okay, don't so mind. Take a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to section. pause this and get my volume working for this video that I've created. So we are going to hit play on this and make sure the volume's up. In order to access the screen recorder on your phone, you're going to want to go to your home page here and you're going to want to click on the settings, which is the icon that is look that looks like a gear. As that opens, you're going to want to scroll down to where it says Control Center. Within Control Center, you're going to want to customize your controls. When you download iOS 11 or the new updated iOS 12, it does not come with the screen recording feature, and so you're going to want to add that. We'll come back on the second video and show you how to do that. But this is the section where you're going to want to be able to customize all of those controls and it's very useful for demonstration purposes, for tutorials for parents and staff members, for using it to upload onto your YouTube site, or using it as a pre-lesson for your students, or in lessons with whatever your screen is displaying. I find it very useful. In order to turn it off, there's the red bar on the top. All you're going to do is select that red button on the top. and then that will stop the video. And then I use that for a variety of tutorial, tutorials for my students and for parents, and, or if I want to educate the staff on a variety of apps, that's where I would do it. The second video I have here um, will also show us how to add and how to, how to delete that. But on your iOS device, you just swipe up and that'll access the control center. And then this will give us a few more details here. A couple other features of the screen recorder are to turn on the volume um, for your voice with the microphone. And you're going to want to do that by swiping up to access the screen recorder. So you're going to swipe up on your phone, and that's going to give you your customized controls. And you can see as it's recording there, that's the icon that you're going to select. You're going to push and hold that, and that will give you the option for turning on the microphone or turning off the microphone. And so that's where that section is at. If we go back into the settings to the control center, I'm going to remove the screen recording feature. And it's going to come down here on the bottom. And that's exactly what yours is going to look like when you first open the control center. And so you can also see that there's a variety of other controls within the control center to customize them. So if you have students that are using guided access, you can add the guided access into your control center with ease, and you can add features for those who have hearing impairments for accessibility. Those with vision difficulties can use the magnifier. Um, you can use the notes section for those individuals who may struggle with executive functioning difficulties. And there's a variety of other things too. The stopwatch feature is very um, useful for, within my classroom. Um, I use that for my students 
so we can transition from activity to activity. And it's just a, a lot more functional now for um, the, the, the First control. First sign, that's green there, and that'll add it to your customized control centers. And you can see there's a variety of other accessibility features there that will be very beneficial for you as well as your students. So I'm just gonna all right, and so I'm going to get my screen back to you guys. And so those are the, uh, the iOS 12, the, the most um, useful updates that I have found for working with our students and staff and um, new ways to target those areas. Awesome. And I, yep. we've been, if you have followed what Chris and I do for a number of years, Probably don't, but we've been um, giving providing updates to iOS for a number of years now, maybe three years, and we found that iOS was ahead of the game for many, many years, or many years, not many, many. But over the last year or so, um, Google Home, uh, Amazon Echo, and uh, Microsoft products have really stepped up their game, and I, I believe that. They're either all at the same point now, or they're so close it's really hard to tell who's ahead and who's not ahead. Uh, for example, um, if you have a Google Home uh, or uh, in your house, this is a great way for you to start um, practicing voice command and some of the, and streamlining some of the things your professional and your personal activities. Um, so, Chris just said Siri has caught up to. Google, and I'm going to say I think that uh, Google Home is still a, a pretty much better than Siri because it's a more human voice, a more intuitive investigation, a more natural um, selection of resources. Uh, so, you know. And, and I want to follow up on that with you real quick, too. Oh, Jennifer, sure. I was yeah. going to follow up. I, I agree with you, absolutely. One, one thing with Siri um, is that in order to get those shortcuts, you do have to manually input them. So it is a bit of more time consuming and it does require you to go in there versus like Google Home and Amazon Alexa th those are already intuitive with your apps um, the right. Siri we're not there yet so that that's just what I just demonstrated on that one yeah it's, you have to go in there and manually put them in that so that can be a little tedious so yeah absolutely right, but, Google Home is still still up on there it's right thanks Chris because we just need to have a thanks I appreciate it we need to have that balanced conversation about it um, now, some of you might be saying, I don't have a Google Home. I don't want a Google Home. I don't want an Amazon Echo. I don't want somebody listening to me all the time in my house. That's valid. However, there is a Google Home app and a Google Assistant app that are free for both iOS and Android-based devices. So you can have your own personal assistant in your mobile device without even having to buy Google, Google Home. And the price on those has gone down, I think it's now like $35. They're just not expensive at all anymore. And if you buy Philips U lights, they oftentimes come with a free Google Home, which is kind of cool. Um, but for personal use, I can just say, hey, go okay, Google, look up strategies for universal design for learning for a high schooler. And Google will get on that and provide me with some resources, um, some websites, but also some valid answers um, that, that can help me streamline my research. Now, if I have a vision impairment, that's awesome for me because I can talk to my phone or my Google Home and get the answers without having to go through several different processes. Um, I've used it for teaching ideas. I've also used it for my personal calendar where I say, okay, Google, add enablement webinar with Chris Wanger on Wednesday on accessibility at noon Pacific Standard Time. And she'll be, okay, got it, and add it in there for us. But my favorite of all time, and this is not for educational purposes, but it's, it, it, oh, a school bell, is a shopping list. Because we have a shared shopping list. So when my husband says to me, please add potatoes to the shopping list, I say add tell Mr. Google's assistant to add potatoes to the shopping list. And because we've shared the list, it streamlines a lot of those personal tasks and skill sets at home. Now, if you think about the students in your care, these kinds of apps can really help them be more productive, um, be more organized uh, using their voice because you can set up a student's schedule. 
through Google Home. You can set up um, reminders through Google Home. You can set up um, planning activities. And if you, like, where is that in the app? So if you go, if you have Google Home app, if you go into the Google Home app, and then you click the lines at the top left, and then under My Activities, you'll see More Settings. There's a whole bunch of settings in there. If you go down to Preferences or Personal Information, or you scroll farther down, you'll see Routines, Shopping List, Reminders, Voice Calls, Videos, Calendar, and even Stock. So it really does help with your student's organization and streamlining their productivity. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is having a meeting with your parents and giving them a mini training on the Google Home app. And that way they can help their child at home be more organized. Um, Chris, did you have anything to add before I move on to the next slide? Well, I just wanted to add, there was a couple questions that um, we were answering here, and so I just wanted to go over those. There was a question oh. regarding um, using the um, alternative augmentative um, communication apps such as maybe one like Avaaz or Proloquo or any of the other ones that are out there that students are using and if Siri and Google Home are responsive to those. And yes, they are. There are settings within each of the AAC apps that you can um, adjust the output. Um, and so that's going to be crucial too. If it, um, you, you would want to set the settings up to where the entire sentence is read once the student does their input. Because oftentimes when we, hey, I get it's all based individually on the student, but sometimes it'll read each word. And what you want to do is you want to change the settings so once the student inputs their sentence, um, that'll read the whole sentence, and then Google and Siri can respond in that way. So I hope that answers that question. Um, but yes, they absolutely um, are able. And it looks like there's another question here. Can screen record yeah, also record audio? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and so yeah, yeah that's okay, the answer to I'm sorry, what was that, Jennifer? Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> on the screen recording, um, there is, a, on the iPad, it's the exact same way to access it. Just make sure that you have your iOS um, update um, ready to go, and you can screen record on your iPad as well in, in much the same manner. Um, as you saw in that second video, you, once you get to your control center, you're going to want to push and hold on the screen recording button, and then that will open up a separate window. And that's where you turn the microphone on, or you can turn it off. Um, you are not able to screen record things such as YouTube videos um, on the Internet, but you can screen record everything else on your iPad. It's just there's certain websites that are, um, will not have audio that will come through. But it will definitely do audio as if you're screencasting um, and use your voice, but it will not pick up on like other videos per se like Vimeo and YouTube and things such as that or, or Netflix. It will not, it will screen record. It won't get the volume. So I hope that Got answers it. those questions. But, okay, so if a person has a, has a speech impediment of some sort, Karen asks, um, will there need to be voice training for them to be understood? If, uh, so if a student has, oh, I see. I have that question right uh -huh. here. Yeah, yeah. Speech therapy. I, it's oftentimes such as using System 44, or Read 180, and other things that require students to dictate into a microphone. If any individual has um, difficulties with verbal output, it's going to be hard for Siri and for Google Home and those types of dictation devices to clearly understand what's being said. So that definitely has um, something to consider. Uh, if there's an individual that does have some type of speech and language impairment, um, then we would want to look at other um, accessibility features and other tools for them to use because that might not be the most sufficient thing for them due to that impairment.
So Susan asks, I have Google Home and Google Assistant. They're available on IRS, I, iOS. Do you have input on using them as opposed to an Android? I only use I, um, Google Home and Google Assistant on an iOS. I don't have an Android device. And they work just fine for me. So they play very well with others. And we're, we're so pleased that these systems are now um, integrating together so that the user isn't the one being frustrated. But they're, they're all playing well together. Does that, does that answer your question, Susan? Well, she's over. So the next, I do the do, next so thing. So I can follow up a little bit on, because uh, I have the other device too. I have a, an Amazon um, Echo Dot. I use that with my students. Um, that connects to the Amazon store, and I know those work much in the same way, but I use those for a variety of things with my students as well. A couple things such as mindfulness and meditation, so when their anxiety or their frustration gets really big, we can um, use different techniques to bring them back to being calm within the classroom. We can use it for those students who are on the spectrum who might have difficulties with initiating um, task or who might have difficulties coming up with questions, um, they can ask um, Alexa, you, you know, a variety of questions and we can build on those pragmatic skills. Um, so there's a lot of, sorry about that, that's my school bell going on. But there's a lot of different features um, between all of those devices that um, can be very helpful for our students. So if you don't mind, Chris, I'm going to stay with this topic and skip over Microsoft Learning Tools and come back to it um, because we just went over the homework help reminders, the managing stress and anxiety. And um, so what I'd like to share right now is another feature in the Google Home app, app called Voice Access. And I don't know how many of you have seen this, but I have a little video, real short, to show you. So I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here. You'll see the 5,000 things open on my screen. And let's get back to it. I am a resource special education teacher. I target groups of students who need intervention for either reading, language, arts, and math. These are kids that struggle every day. And to watch them grow and learn and have those aha moments is so rewarding to me. It just makes my heart soar. We have ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia. I have a student who reads on a third grade level, but then I have a student who reads on a kindergarten level. And I have to find a way to bridge the gap. We've been using OneNote since the beginning of this school year. Even in the short amount of time that we've had it, it's been completely transformational. When we first started using OneNote, I thought, okay, this is going to take us a while to get going, and we're going to have to learn how to use it in three days. It took them three days to master OneNote. I have a dyslexic student. He's also a dysgraphic. He still reads on a kindergarten level. Yeah, he's still he's still saying sight words. And, you know, he would tell me all the time that he was stupid. When we started this school year, he read four words for me. For the longest time, I struggled with how to help him. And when we got the learning tool with the immersive reader, he went to 22 words for me. I never thought in one calendar school year that we would even get into double digits. And he got 22 words per minute, and he stayed there. the Microsoft Learning Tools uh, video that was the slide before, but Microsoft has really come uh, such a long way in providing these learning tools, which are a great resource for students with disabilities. Um, 
as a reminder, we have a um, resource list. We have all the video links and some really great resources for you that will be emailed out to you at the, at the end of the presentation with this presentation. So if you didn't quite catch that and you need it again, it will be coming to you again at the end of the presentation. So now while I'm still sharing my screen, I'll go on to what I thought I was showing. It was voice access. Um, and here's a little video that will show you more about that. My name is Steffi, and I just finished my master's in advertising. I'm a C4, C5 split level quadriplegic. I have no feelings from my collarbone down, so it is absolutely vital that I'm able to use my voice. Okay, Google, start voice access. My name is Jeff, and I have a neurological condition called essential tremor. It is incredibly difficult to use my hands and fingers. It is very easy for me to use my voice. Okay, Google. Start voice access. After using this product for probably about 10 seconds, I think I'm falling in love with it. Open camera. You use your voice, and you're able to access the world. Shutter. Share. Hangout. Astrid Weber. Send. I cannot tell you how excited I am about this product. Open calendar. New when you don't have the ability to use your fingers and hands. Family movie night. Really all about voice. These are really great, great options for us. Um, okay, Google, bring, save your things from. And yeah, not that. I need to get back to the presentation. Hold on. All right. Are we back? We're back. Awesome. All right. So you'll see, you see that voice access and learning tools by Microsoft have really streamlined the capability of people with severe physical, visual, or motor impairments to be able to navigate in the world. And mind you, voice access is um, device agnostic, so it runs very well on an iOS and an Android-based system. So the bottom line here uh, is that iOS, Google, Android, Microsoft, they're all offering accessibility tools that improve daily living and education. So now we have about 30 minutes left. We'd like to share our top four tools from the field. Um, so we deliberated quite a bit. And the, the, here's what we love, why we love them, and how we use them. So. Chris, the first one is Book Creator, and I know you're going to take that away. Book Creator is originally – oops, sorry about that. There we go. So here's our first tool, Book Creator. And it started off as an iPad app, and students were able to get on there and create a variety of ways to reinforce their learning, create books, to use um, their ability to be creative. And now they have Book Creator as part of a website through Google Chrome browser. So whatever device you're on, you can use Book Creator as long as you're using the Google Chrome browser. It will not work within Mozilla's Firefox or Safari or Internet Explorer. So just, ensure, just make sure that you are using the Google Chrome browser and what I'm going to do is share my screen with you guys so you can see um, what Book Creator has to offer. So we're on my screen. You're going to go to bookcreator.com within the Google, Google Chrome browser. And then I'm going to – I'm signed in here. So once you come to sign in, you can have your students share a code, and you guys can all be within the same library. So if you're talking about a certain topic or a certain subject, 
all of the students' books that they create are saved within this library. On the very top left is where you would create the book. And again, this is a free resource. And the students would come here and they'd have a variety of books that they can create. They can create um, a portrait, square, landscape, or you can get into creating comics. For the students that um, I work with that are working on perspective taking skills and that are working on conversation exchanges and comic book conversations, um, those kids who struggle with pragmatics, I create a comic. So within that, you would click on the one of their preference or the one that you would like them to do, and it comes up to a blank page. On the blank page, you have a variety of things that are up on the very top right. On your plus sign, that's where you would add or change the cover. And so since we're talking about creating a comic, a student can create a variety of panels that would cater to what their interests are and how many different frames they would like. So we would, let's say we wanted to do a, a panel with, with three squares. Um, we would click on that button again and we can add media, we can add thought bubbles, we can add speech bubbles, we can add a variety of text, we can add stickers, and then there's a variety of shapes that you can add and media. So the media is where you can import their own pictures. You can pull things from off the internet. Um, you can use the, your camera on your computer if they have one. They have the pen feature so they can um, write and mark up on their screen. They can record their voice. I think the voice recording when they're creating a book is a very valuable tool. Because that way, if you have students who um, are working on expressive language um, or are working on story retail or social narrative, they can use that feature as well. And it's very highly motivating and engaging for the students. So that is um, a really cool feature. And then the shapes is where they can add in their arrows and they can change the colors of all of these things. And um, it's a really, really simple tool to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my book. So that's up here on the far left. And show you a couple examples. So this is the one that we just created. We didn't really create a book, but I'll show you a couple that I have created to target different areas. Um, down on the bottom left, we have our options to either import the book or we can move it to a library that the students are already a part of um, so they can collaborate together. Um, or you can combine books that students have created, or you can just delete the book. In this case, I'm just going to delete the book because we don't need it because we didn't add anything to it. Make sure that you see all of the art. Flying color. In color. Flying color is a great way to be creative and old. Okay, so let me get back into here. And so here's a couple examples. So here's a book that we created using the zones of regulation. So we we're targeting self-regulation strategies with our students on how to be calm. So the blue zone, um, we put a bunch of emojis on how to re refrain or how to stay calm in situations. The green zone for the happy thoughts or being content or wanting to work with others, we added a variety of emojis for that. And we added emojis for the yellow zone, which is going to be your frustration or you're getting a little um, on edge or maybe excited. And then the red zone is going to be the zone where um, the students are very frustrated or there's something that went terribly wrong. So it was a really easy way to talk about and create um, the tools within the book to target their needs and it aligned perfect with their IEP goals. Created page two um, for talking about um, five point scale on how to address that. So you can use the pen feature to add different things as I mentioned to you. Um, you click on the top, we've got our media, we can use the pen, um, or you can add text, and that's exactly what we did. You can record your voice over it as you get different pages, add shapes, and you can see that there's a little sketch, um, sketch that the students use with some thought bubbles, some things that they're talking about um, with different images that we've imported to really hit a concept. So, um, that's one example of, of how it can be used. Um, some other examples are, 
And it can, uh, so for history class, um, the ABCs of World War II, you can have the students, rather than give a classroom presentation using PowerPoint, um, they can create an online book. Again, they can use their voice to dictate and record. And so they had to go through um, each letter of the alphabet, add in a letter of the alphabet that went along with World War II, and they had to find a piece of information that tied into that letter. And so um, it's really simple for the kids to use. Again, it's highly engaging. And, and you can do it for sequencing, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We had them sequence it. You can see that we broke it down based on a big category. How do we itemize different things and label them? So now we're working with that whole semantic relationship on how words are connected together, what goes into different categories. Um, and then we're also creating um, this book in a, fun, in a fun way. And then we can have them um, describe uh, the steps as they're doing it. So there's really the options are endless on how to create um, an online book. It's really easy to use. And then within the book, so let's go back to the how to make a pickle. Here we go, five-point scale on relationships because that's always needed for the high school kids I work with. Up here, if you click on the information, you can change the borders, the pattern, the textures of the book, and really, really make it shine. And then you can have the option of playing the book and have it read to the students if they've used their voice to dictate it. And um, the other really neat thing about it is that you can share this. Um, you can publish it online or you can download it. You can print the book. You can bring this to the parents during IEP meetings to sh demonstrate how they're targeting their I IEP goals um, and just use it for a variety of, of, of things. So it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty cool feature for it being free and it's one of my favorite tools to use. And I'm going to get us back into here. So that is um, Book Creator. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, I love two. it. Oh, it's, and it's free. Did we mention that it's free? And it's a and extension it's through Google only, not Firefox, not Safari, not Explorer. Right? Correct. Okay. So now here's, here's a new surprising one, and I'm showcasing this as one of my favorites. Um, because it's new, well, the, the streamlining of OneDrive is new to me. Office 365 um, is a Microsoft product, and I'm kind of an iOS person myself, but more and more Schools and districts are going to Office 365 over the Google Suite, which is an interesting shift. Um, anyway, so I was very curious about it, and so I am, I am a member of the Quality Indicators for Assistive Technology List Serve. It's a, it's a group of um, special educators, practitioners, researchers, vendors, parents, students, teachers, um, specifically looking at assistive technology to help with disabilities. And uh, y'all should join. It's an amazing, amazing bunch of uh, like 30,000 people nationwide and Canada. I, I put the link in our resources um, handout that you'll get in the email. Anyway, so I posted this question. Is OneDrive accessible? What do you think about Office 365? Is it really like worth looking into? And it, Amazingly, um, my people on, on the quiet list are very, very honest, um, and they'll tell you exactly how it is. But, but a couple people said, you know, it was, um, they were falling far behind for a long time, but in the, past few, in the past year or so, they've really stepped up their game, maybe two years. But um, one of the, the cool things right now with, Office, with Microsoft OneDrive is that they added a Scan feature, which allows documents to be scanned in, just like an Office Lens app, and it will automatically create a PDF and save it to a folder on OneDrive. Then the student can open up the PDF within the OneDrive app, and by pressing the pencil icon, it brings a toolbar where the student can annotate, meaning the student can type and draw on the PDF. So 
it's a great way for students to complete paper-based worksheets digitally since the students can draw and type right on the PDF with an iOS keyboard or other accessible keyboards. They can dictate their thoughts and have the iPad using speech to text and the iPad can transcribe their thoughts using speech recognition on the iPad. Um, so now Microsoft OneDrive and Apple are working together to support students. And so the products are now being streamlined, which is very encouraging to me. Um, Apple also has support now for the Apple Pencil and the Logitech Crayon on the basic iPad from 2018. And they can be used in the OneDrive app, which is an amazingly versatile package. So one of the things that you have to remember to do is within OneDrive, you need to create a folder that's shared between the student and the teacher so that when the teacher, the teacher puts the worksheet into the folder, the student accesses it from the same folder, brings it up, annotates on it, annotates on the, uh, the PDF, or uh, dictates their thoughts using uh, speech-to-text software, and then closes it and it saves it automatically to that same shared folder. So you're eliminating, the, you're eliminating the need for email back and forth or all these other outside ways to get worksheets between home and school. So all the numerous steps that used to have to happen don't have to happen anymore. Um, it's a real game changer and I, I, it makes me very encouraged that Microsoft has gone to those levels to really um, embrace iOS, Android, Google. Everybody's trying to play together and that just benefits all of us, including the, the students that we teach with disabilities. Um, so you can get a OneDrive app on iOS. Isn't that amazing? So that's my like that's my favorite tool this awesome. week because I'm excited. I'm excited about looking into that more and helping other teachers who are moving to Office 365 instead of the Google Suite um, to be able to use that. Yeah. So Absolutely. there it is. Okay, Chris, Co-Writer. Co-Writer is not a free tool, but it's an amazing tool. I'll preface it with that because most of our, many of my students that I work with um, who are the struggling readers and the struggling writers need that additional support and those um, accommodations and modifications type tools to really help them. And I think that this accessibility tool is an amazing way to help our students with the writing component. So I'm going to share my screen and show you guys how this works. And you have this screen in front of you that can kind of give you an idea of what it does. It talks about word prediction, um, translation support, and so we're going to see how um, we can really get that flow of writing working. So on my site here, we come into my my desktop here, and we're going to widen it open a little bit. So within Google Chrome, again, this is a Chrome extension, so it will not work within Microsoft um, Internet Explorer or um, Safari or Firefox or any of those. It's a, it's a Chrome extension. So Chrome and Google have really kind of stepped up their game in that regard. And so what we'll see is once you install it, it comes up on this toolbar right up here and it's right here for the co-writer. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on co-writer and it'll prompt me to sign in. So we're going to click on that and it logs me in and you see it popped up with a word prediction tool within my document already. The nice thing before I get started talking about this is it doesn't just use word prediction, it uses what they call neuron word prediction. So it's an engine that follows basically the natural relationships of ideas and concepts that happen within the brain. When you're writing on a specific topic, co-writer automatically understands what the topic is and it predicts ahead using topic-specific vocabulary. So what that means is if the students are given an assignment to write an autobiography on someone that had some significance um, over, over time, and one of the students wants to write about Leonardo da Vinci, we can click on this middle button here where it says Manage Topics, and then we can search from literally millions of topics that are embedded in this. 
And so we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci. We're going to Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci. We're going to select him, and that topic is now selected. And so everything that I type is going to be topic specific related to Leonardo da Vinci. So when I type the letter L, it's going to already know that I'm talking about Leonardo da Vinci. So, um, so we can type that. I just hit L, Leonardo, and it's going to predict Leonardo. what might be the next sentence. Turn down my volume here. Leonardo da Vinci um, was a, and I could put famous, so I put F-A-M. So usually it will be able to predict within two or three letters. When you do a Google search, um, it does, it's not topic specific. So it does has no clue what you're looking to research online. This is huge for our students because some of them get stuck on their thoughts and this will help those kids um, unstick those ideas and really increase the fluidity of their writing and their written expression. Um, so we click on that. And so that's kind of how that works. I'm going to show you a couple different features that you can use within that. One, another feature that is used within this um, is speech recognition. So on my – let's finish this sentence and we'll add another one. We're going to famous – we can say he was a famous everything. He was an engineer, an artist, and so we'll just put artist for now. So um, right here where the microphone's at is speak to text. So what that does is we would click on the microphone and we can speak. And what co-writer would do is it's going to turn into text right in front of us as we speak. Um, and you can do that within the Google Drive. You can do that with email and all across the web. Um, the nice thing it, is that it even reads the dictated text aloud. Um, if it doesn't give you the correct word, you can go back and click on the word, and it will give you suggestions um, based on what the content is. So um, if you're talking about Leonardo da Vinci and it didn't give you the right word, you click on that word, and it will be topic-based to predict for you. Be mindful, as we talked about this in the question that somebody asked, if a student has some difficulties with um, their verbal expression or they may misarticulate words, um, that could present a problem. Um, be mindful of the environment that you're in. It must be in a quiet environment if you're going to use that speech to text. And so you would click on this and say, and then we click on our speak. He was born in Venice. Chris? Yes? So Christina has a question. Um, she wants okay. to know the app that you can purchase. Um, uh, will it work on other devices besides iOS devices? So it'll, it's device agnostic. You can use it across any device. So you can use it on a Chromebook. You okay. can use it on a PC. The main thing to note is that it has to be within Google Chrome. Um, wow. Another thing, if you're going to use it on, like, let's say, an iPad or a tablet. Um, there's there's an app that you can purchase, and I believe it it used to be about thirty or forty dollars, um, and it does the exact same thing, and it's an awesome app to use. So if you do have students that are within the class on an iPad, uh, I highly recommend that too. But yeah, so this would work across any device as long as you have Google Chrome. Okay, so Julia asks um, where, how, and where to find the app. Isn't okay, that John so, is that Don Johnson product? Yep, so let me show you. So we are going to go up right to the top left up there where it says the apps, and so that's our apps store. If you do not have the app store on your bookmarks, you can Google it and just type in Google App Store. And let's show you. So when I click on apps, I go into the web store, which is going to be right here. Oh, page marker doesn't work within here. Okay, so you're going to go your web store, and then within your web store, you're going to want to type in co-writer, and it'll pop up, co-writer. And we'll just hit enter, and there it is, and you just add to Chrome. And once you hit add to Chrome, it'll put it right up in your extension bar up on the top right. So, Daniela, um, you – hold on one second. Daniela, I asked if you need a USB headset for dictating. You can use a USB headset. You could also just use a phone, I mean your iPhone or your, your phone headset with your earbuds. 
that works very well for dictating as well. Don't get all fancy. Just find something that, that will work for your students. Um, and Stacy, we're getting back to you in a minute. I'm going to talk about Read and Write for Google after Chris is done with CoWriter, okay? Uh, Susan asked if she works with visually impaired and blind students, and she's wondering if you know how to how accessible these top four tools are with screen readers like Chrome, Box, VoiceOver, or JAWS. Her team has approached some of the developers and the with the not much response. So before I ask Chris to address that, because he, he knows a lot about this, Susan, I want to invite you again to um, to join the Quiet Listserv Quality Indicators for Assistive Technology. It's led by Dr. Joy Zabala. This is a perfect question for the quiet people. They will get you an answer. You will get multiple answers from multiple people across the nation, and they will give you feedback and examples and references and links and just so much support. So. I mean, Chris is going to address it now. That's awesome. And you can always email he or I when you have questions. But also, the Quality Indicators for Assistive Technology team, they have it going on. So that's another way. Chris, how would you address that question? All right. So, so the question, if I gathered that correctly, is um, the individual works with students who are visually impaired and yes. um, hearing impaired? So yes. no, blind. with co-writer, what's that? Uh, visually impaired blind. Visually impaired blind. Okay, so on on CoWriter, if you go into the options, you have a variety of things on the. If you can see over here on the right, I'll grab my little. It uh, doesn't look like page marker is going to work right there either. But if you can see right here, you can have it speak the letters as the letters are typed in, um, or um, speak words or sentences, so it reads it out. So it becomes a screen reader. Um, and you can also use your voice, as I just demonstrated, for the speech-to-text component. So it's not only hitting the, the verbal output, and it's, it's reading the screen back to you. Jennifer is going to cover the read and write, and that's going to um, be a really cool tool for the, um, the text-to-speech to where it will read websites and a variety of other things. But you can do whatever's inputted within CoWriter um, with, on the options as well. I hope that answered the question. I'm going to transition back to Jennifer so that way we can cover the read and write and then we will conclude this session. So Jennifer, I'm going to pass it on over to you. Perfect. So yeah, read and write has been traditionally free for teachers, but you have to purchase a subscription uh, for your students. But if you get a school-wide subscription, it's not that expensive. Co-writer tends to be a little bit more expensive um, and probably a little bit more robust, but Chris knows more about CoWriter than I do. I love Read and Write um, for Google Chrome because it's, again, free for teachers, low cost for students. Some new features on Read and Write are that there's a type and talk feature so on Google Slides. So Read and Write has joined forces with uh, Google Classroom now, which is amazing. Uh, so that literally if you have a Google presentation, you can talk right onto the Google Slides. Um, there's also a PDF reader now that's available for Google Classroom. So not only websites and um, web-based documents and PDF files that are on the web can be, read, uh, can be worked on with Read and Write, but also things within Google Classroom. So that's a pretty cool marriage. Um, there's a lot more language options. I'm going to show you that in just a second. And there's improved uh, text-to-speech options on the web. So I'm going to do a final share. Do, 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 do. And I am actually on our AbleNet presentation, but I'm on my own website. I mean, I'm on my own browser. I'm in Chrome. Um, and I have the little read and white icon here. Things are grayed out right now because I haven't used it in a bit. but. Um, I want to show you some ways that you can customize read and write to meet your needs and the needs of your students. So we've gone through all these features before in previous webinars, um, and, but I'm going to show you how to customize right now and go through the features at the same time. So if I click the little purple down arrow on the right, and I go to options, you have speech, prediction, screen masking, language, and features options on the left. And then you can go into the features on the right. So let's start at the top. You have speech options. 
you can change the voice that um, Read and Write uses for the text-to-speech option. You can customize the speed of that voice to meet the needs of your learners. You can allow continuous reading of, of a website, or you can stop it. So it just reads line by line. And translation now is more than just into Spanish. There's a lot more uh, languages. And if I upgraded to a premium account, but I don't because I'm cheap, but if I did, I would have all of these languages at my fingertips also. So if you're an ELL uh, instructor or you work with students from various uh, cultures and languages, it might be a really good purchase for you. Then in word prediction, you can customize between three and ten words that you uh, allow to your students to have exposure to. So if you've got a little one and ten words uh, would be overwhelming, you might just choose to customize it to only three words. Um, the cursor can follow while typing, or you can change that. And you can also change the, set to, uh, the text size of um, the read and write to meet the needs of, of your learner. So if they, they can read a teeny tiny text, and you, that way you can have more on the screen, you can do that. But if you have someone with a visual impairment and you need that big text, you can do that as well. Uh, screen masking is another really cool feature um, that just masks the screen. So if your student has a, a visual disability and can't read black text on white, you can change the background color and you can change the reading light color. You have a, a lot of options in here now. You can change the opacity of the background, the reading light opacity, the reading light height, and turn off the reading light if it's too overwhelming for your kiddos. Then in language, as I just showed you, there's a lot of languages available. And this is, well, there's you know, several in the free version, and there's all of those in the premium, as I just showed you. And then features. This is, now I lost it, so I'm going to go back to the purple arrow. Go back to options. Click features. So these are all the features that are available to you on Read and Write. And we've gone over these in previous webinars. Um, that are housed now in AbleNet, so you can go back and listen to the recorded webinars and get a deeper um, description of those. But what's really cool here is now you can um, reorder the features. Right now they're going from, this is from left to right on the toolbar at the top, so predi prediction you see way over here on the left, and it goes across to through hover speech, dictionary, picture dictionary, all the way down to practice reading aloud, which is on the far right. You can turn off any of the features that you don't want your students to have access to to make the toolbar less overwhelming, which is great, or by, just by turning them off. I don't want predictions. Boom, turned it off. And now it's back. I don't want a, uh, it, I'm dealing with kindergartners. I don't want a word dictionary. I don't even want them to be confused by that. I just want the picture dictionary. So you can turn on or off any feature, the highlight colors, simplify a page, adding a voice note. Also, if you just put your mouse over the far right of that feature, you can reorder them. So maybe I don't want the dictionary to be the third one from the left. I just take it and drag it, and now the dictionary is the first one on the left. So I can reorder the features um, to meet the needs of your students and what is logical for them and help, to help them manage their workflow so they don't become super annoyed or overwhelmed. So those are some of the new things in Read and Write. Uh, it's pretty amazing what they've done, especially that they're a little bit more married into Google Classroom now. So awesome. yeah, it's really exciting. Really cool stuff. Okay, so we have a little um, we have a little quiz for you right now. We put up put it up on the on the slide. We have a poll of all the tools I've learned about. The most interesting are iOS 12, Android, Google stuff, or all of it. And that helps us guide us for future presentations for you guys, so we can really share the knowledge that, that is, continues to be updated by these um, tools. Yeah, we really take your feedback seriously. We read through it together and we meet and we're like, okay, this works really well and they want more of this next time. And so we'll just develop 
the next presentation to really uh, meet your needs. That's what it is all about for us. I think we, we have, we've got 45 responses. Anyone else want to respond to the first question before we move on? There's 82 of you online. There we go. Now we have 47. All right. Let's uh, – should we skip to the next slide or skip to – no, let's skip to the next slide. I would like to know more about implementation strategies, where to find updated information, or everything. I love all y'all They say everything, because I'm on everything, girl. I want to know everything about everything about everything. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay, we'll give it another 30 seconds. One more. I think we have one more Looks question. Like one, two, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then our contact info will be on that side if you hang tight. Um, and right. Well, I know we're two minutes we'll be over. Answer any other questions. Here we go. The last question. I'm interested in Chris and Jen developing a presentation on more Google extensions, bring my own device implementation, another speech dude presentation, or something else. Uh, how many speech dudes do we have now, Chris? Three or four? I think we, we have, have about three. Four? Is it four? Yeah, it might be four. <laughs> I don't know. It could be. It's either three or four. <laughs> One of those. Looks like Google extensions is the popular one. We'll get a lot more of that coming up in the near future. Good, and some more BYOD as well. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. We'll leave it open for another 30 seconds. I think Google won. Google's got that one. Mm-hmm. All right, so, um, so yeah, any final questions or comments? While you're putting in a, any final questions, we really um, appreciate you taking an hour with us today. We know that your time is valuable. We know that you have uh, many, many things to do, including IEPs and meeting with parents and meeting with students and all kinds of paperwork and preparation for the good work that you do. So. Um, we're really very grateful that you're willing to spend an hour with us. Um, our contact information is on this slide. And to remind you, um, we will be, or AbleNet will be um, sending out this presentation as a PDF and then also the handout we created that has a list of great links and resources for you so that you can keep, keep on learning.